This Sunday, that stunning testimony. We are watching Capitol building get defaced over a lie. Former White House aide Cassidy Hutchinson on President Trump learning his January 6th supporters were armed. I don't even care that they have weapons. They're not here to hurt me. On Mr. Trump insisting he joined the mob at the Capitol. The president said something to the effect of, I'm the effing president, take me up to the Capitol now. And quoting Mark Meadows on learning that the rioters wanted to hang Vice President Mike Pence. He thinks Mike deserves it. He doesn't think they're doing anything wrong. But now with challenges to some of her testimony, Republicans are again dismissing the hearing. Partisan committee, a witch hunt just to keep going after Donald Trump, not to get facts. This morning, I'll talk to committee member Zoe Lofgren and to NBC News legal analyst Danny Savalos about the legal jeopardy Mr. Trump may now be in. Plus, after Roe. I don't think it could get more confusing. Abortion restrictions are being challenged in more than a dozen states. Trigger law is an extremist law. With abortion rights supporters worried the Biden administration is not fighting hard enough, I'll talk to HHS Secretary Javier Becerra. And Democrats growing doubts about President Biden. Democrats have a very deep bench, and it's time to allow a new generation to emerge and new talent. Why more Democrats, mostly off the record, are saying the president shouldn't run for re-election. Joining me for insight and analysis are former Homeland Security Secretary Jay Johnson, NBC News Capitol Hill correspondent Ali Vitale, Matthew Continetti of the American Enterprise Institute, and Mariana Sotomayor of The Washington Post. Welcome to Sunday. It's Meet the Press. From NBC News in Washington, the longest running show in television history, this is Meet the Press with Chuck Todd. A good Sunday morning, and I hope you are enjoying this July 4th weekend. But even as the country celebrates the 246th anniversary of our independence, the lines that separate us seem to be growing bolder and brighter by the day. Abortion rights advocates versus abortion opponents. Americans eager to limit the availability of guns versus Second Amendment enthusiasts. Climate change versus drill, baby, drill. Blue versus red. Left versus right. And no single person personifies our disunity or aggravates our wounds more than Donald Trump. On Tuesday, in the unscheduled fifth hearing of the January 6th committee, we heard shocking testimony that has been compared to Watergate's John Dean. Former White House aide Cassidy Hutchinson described nothing less than a violent coup attempt urged on by a president who was more active participant than passive observer. Cassidy testified that Mr. Trump knew the mob was armed, wanted to go to the Capitol with them, even agreed that Vice President Mike Pence deserved to be hanged, and was in danger of being declared unfit to serve by a majority of his cabinet. Knives, guns in the form of pistols and rifles, um, bear spray, body armor, spears. I got three men walking down the street in fatigue while carrying AR-15. I overheard the president say something to the effect of, you know, I, I don't effin care that they have weapons. They're not here to hurt me. Take the effing mags away. Let my people in. They can march to the Capitol from here. President Trump was aware that a number of the individuals in the crowd had weapons and were wearing body armor. And here's what President Trump instructed the crowd to do. We're going to walk down, and I'll be there with you. We're going to walk down to the Capitol. Tony described him as being irate. The president said something to the effect of, I'm the effing president. Take me up to the Capitol now. To which Bobby responded, Sir, we have to go back to the West Wing. The president reached up towards the front of the vehicle to grab at the steering wheel. Mr. Engel grabbed his arm, said, Sir, you need to take your hand off the steering wheel. We're going back to the West Wing. We're not going to the Capitol. Mr. Trump then used his free hand to lunge towards Bobby Angle. I remember Pat saying something to the effect of, Mark, we need to do something more. They're literally calling for the vice president to be effing hung. And Mark had responded something to the effect of, you heard him, Pat. He thinks Mike deserves it. He doesn't think they're doing anything wrong. And joining me now is Democratic Congresswoman Zoe Lofgren of California who is on the January 6th committee. Congresswoman, welcome back to Meet the Press. Good morning. Let me start with your simple reaction to 
particularly the former president and a couple of people around them, disputing certain parts of Cassidy Hutchinson's testimony. And I know not the larger part, but some of the specific details. What do you make of that pushback, Congresswoman? Well, we always expected Trump world to try and discredit her, and they are not disappointing us in that regard. Uh, I thought her testimony was credible. She has nothing to gain uh, th by stepping forward and telling the truth, and Trump world has everything to lose by the truth. So they are doing their best uh, to try and attack her, to discredit her. Um, you know, I am not surprised by this effort, but it is not uh, the right thing to do. Can you describe the efforts you, the committee makes to corroborate a ch some of the charges Ms. Hutchinson made before she appeared? Um, did you contact Secret Service, some of these other entities? Well, we had interviewed um, Mr. Ornato several times. His memory uh, does not appear to be as precise as hers. Um, we certainly would welcome them to come back if they wish to do that. Um, but her overall testimony that the president, then president, <clears throat> wanted to go to the Capitol is consistent with other testimony that we have received. Uh, certainly uh, her testimony that she directly overheard uh, President Trump mm -hmm. uh, saying that he didn't care if they had weapons, if the crowd had weapons, that they were not going to hurt him and that they could march to the Capitol with their weapons after the speech. That was new and uh, stunning, really. You know, there's always cameras on the presidential motorcade. Have you gotten any footage? It's possible there is footage of the uh, alleged incident in the uh, SUV. Have you guys subpoenaed that footage, whether it's from news organizations or the Secret Service? Well, we'll look at everything, but I think it's important to note uh, Ms. Hutchinson was relating a story that Mr. Ornato told to her. She never, uh, she wasn't in the vehicle. Uh, she didn't see it. She was relating what he told her. Mm -hmm. um, the, the important thing is that no one is disputing that Trump wanted to go to the Capitol. He even said so in his speech. Right. Uh, there's a lot of evidence that when he w went back to the White House, he still wanted to go uh, to the Capitol and um, was certainly well aware of the violence that was going on. Um, you you uh, made a, a diplomatic response about Mr. Ornato saying that he seems to not have a precise memory. Congresswoman Stephanie Murphy told me earlier this week that uh, something similar he did not have clear of memories at that time. Adam Kinzinger went further and he said that Mr. Ornato likes to lie. Let me ask you this. Has Mr. Ornato testified under oath in any of these um, interviews that you've had with him? It's important to note that it's uh, if you lie to Congress, it's a crime whether or not you're under oath. Um, but was he so, under oath? Uh, it's a crime to lie to Congress when you come in for an interview, whether you come in for a deposition. So I'll, I'll say this, Mr. Ornato was uh, a political appointee of President Trump. Right. Uh, it raised a lot of eyebrows at the time uh, that unlike all prior Secret Service agents protecting the president, uh, he was then also appointed to be deputy uh, assistant to uh, uh, the president. And so he uh, was involved in clearing uh, the square so the president could hold up a Bible right. in front of the church. I mean, he was involved in all of that. He's part of Trump world. No, I understand that. You've been hesitant to confirm or deny whether he's under oath. And I understand what you're saying. It is still a crime to lie to Congress. Uh, is it that you're not sure he was under oath or he was not under oath? I believe he was under oath. Um, but uh, certainly, if he wants to come back and uh, clarify his prior uh, information, uh, he will also be under oath. Uh, I think it's a mistake to focus on whether or not mm -hmm. uh, he was lying to uh, Ms. Hutchinson when he relayed that story. The fact is, the president knew there were his his crowd was armed. Right. We heard the Capitol, uh, the Metropolitan Police describing seeing assault weapons on this crowd. He wanted to go down to the Capitol with them. He said that in his speech. And right. We have a lot of evidence that that was true, even when he returned to the White House. 
Let me ask you about Pat Cipollone. You've officially put a subpoena out to him this past week. Why, why now? Right. Why not two months ago? Why not three months ago? Why not four months ago? We have been engaging with Mr. Cipollone. Um, he did have an informal um, interview or discussion. Uh, that was all he was willing to do. Uh, but there have been ongoing discussions to see if he would come in and talk further. After Ms. Hutchinson's testimony that was so um, uh, informative, mm -hmm. it's very clear that we would like uh, him to come in. Now, I, I know that he is concerned about uh, executive uh, uh, privilege. Right. Uh, that's not a, that's not an absolute immunity. Um, it's it's uh, it falls when there is something more important, uh, and that is true in this case. And certainly, the current president, Mr. Biden, has waived executive privilege on most occasions when right. it comes to getting the truth about the events leading up to January six. You want him to come in for he's subpoenaed to come in for a deposition on July six. Is that going to happen on July six? Well, I hope so. Um, you know. Our intention is to hear from him, and I think given the testimony of Ms. Hutchinson that he uh, was trying to uh, prevent uh, crimes from being committed on yeah. that day, I would assume that he would want to come in. I want to get you to react to this New York Times lead. Uh, the federal prosecutors working on the case were just as astonished by Hutchinson's account of former President Donald J. Trump's increasingly desperate bid to hold on to power as other viewers. The panel did not provide them, meaning DOJ, with videos or transcripts of her taped interviews with committee members beforehand, according to several officials, leaving them feel, feeling blindsided. Is that a fair uh, characterization that you blindsided justice on this? I don't think so. We're not an arm of the Department of Justice. We're a legislative committee. Uh, they have subpoena power. They could subpoena Ms. Hutchinson. I'm surprised they had not done so. Um, we uh, interviewed her four times. I think that's publicly known at this point. Yeah. And the uh, fourth interview uh, was uh, very compelling. And it's obvious she is being uh, intimidated. Uh, people are trying to discredit her. People were trying to dissuade her uh, from testifying. The uh, Trump world was paying for her lawyers, which was very right. problematic for her. She changed lawyers and got an independent lawyer and then proceeded. Um, you know, we're... we're I, I was surprised that the prosecutors were surprised. What are they doing over there? They have a much a greater opportunity right. to enforce their subpoenas than our legislative committee does. At a point some of us were discussing this morning. Um, the last question I, I would throw at you is the issue of so-called witness tampering. Do you feel like you have enough evidence to prove that is what's happened? Well, I don't know. That's, you know, charging someone with a crime is not our... Uh, uh, opportunity. We don't ha can't do that. We're a legislative committee. But I will say this: if witnesses are being intimidated, we don't plan to just sit by and allow that to happen. We're going to raise a stink about it. We're going to refer information uh, publicly to uh, the Department of Justice if witnesses yeah. are intimidated because it's a crime. It's a crime to do that. We're going to see Cassidy Hutchinson testify one more time. I don't know yet. I always leave the chairman mm -hmm. uh, to announce the future hearings. Congresswoman Zoe Lofgren, a member of the January 6th Committee, Democrat from California. Good to see you. Thank you for coming on and sharing your perspective. Happy Fourth of July. You too. The hearings have raised the prospect that former President Trump faces real legal liability for his actions before and on January 6th, among them obstructing a congressional proceeding, conspiracy to defraud the United States, seditious conspiracy, wire fraud, and, as we just were talking about, possible witness tampering. So joining me now to sort of go through this is our NBC News legal analyst, Danny Savalos. So Danny, you, you see those five charges there. You've watched these hearings with me. Where are the, which are the charges that the former president ought to really be concerned about? You had the one that I think is the most pertinent dead last on that list, and it is witness tampering. Okay. And the reason I say so is that Congress specifically enacted the relevant statute, Section 1512, in order to make it more expansive, to sweep more broadly and cover any official proceeding. It doesn't need to be a grand jury proceeding or a judicial proceeding. Mm -hmm. And the witness doesn't even have to actually testify. The witness doesn't even need to have 
firsthand knowledge. This statute just prevents or criminalizes any kind of harassment or corrupt persuasion mm -hmm. in order to prevent a witness from communicating information to law enforcement. And I got to tell you, I mean, I've defended cases where the corrupt persuasion standard uh, is in play. And when you look up what it means to do something corruptly, the definition is an improper purpose. So you're right back at square one. And the point I make there is that it's very malleable. And the government knows that, and that's why they succeed very often whenever they you bring charges. You think it's an easier case to bring in some ways, witness I do. tampering? Absolutely. Anytime you have that corrupt persuasion standard, and it appears in other uh, statutes in the U.S. Code, it makes it relatively easy to prove an improper purpose. I mean, what's an improper purpose? Uh, it might be preventing this information from going to law enforcement, not necessarily testifying under oath. That was Congress's intent when it passed Section 1512, to make this sweep as broadly as possible and protect witnesses. What about his actions on January 6th? It, it is more and more looks like he was an active participant rather than, as we stated earlier, a passive observer. Is there a there there? Potentially, at least according to Judge David Carter, who mm -hmm. uh, had an opinion several months ago. Now, I caution folks that in laying out a kind of map for prosecuting Trump and John Eastman for, say, conspiracy to, I guess, defraud the United States or to obstruct a proceeding. If you're looking for that, this opinion does give kind of a roadmap, but it was in the context of deciding that there was no privilege. So folks should understand it has no direct effect. It's not the effect of a probable cause finding. Okay. It's almost like an advisory opinion. It's almost like the judge saying, hey, here's my take on it, but it really only goes to whether or not privilege applies. But folks at the time pointed out correctly that this provided a basic roadmap for DOJ officials, very much like these congressional hearings are providing a roadmap for the DOJ. But at the same time, I put an asterisk on that because whatever power the committee has to obtain information, the DOJ has superpowers compared so to the committee. That's exactly what the congresswoman was just saying. And in fact, when she was sort of responding to this idea that justice was shocked by Cassidy Hutchinson's testimony, and she just said, you got basically more powerful subpoenas than Congress does. What are you guys doing? What does it tell you that a witness surprised them? Does it tell you that their investigation is not as thorough yet? It tells me, if that's true, that Hutchinson must have flown under their radar, and by they I mean the DOJ, because the DOJ has vast abilities to investigate, much more than a congressional committee. By the way, Chuck, in the last few years, we've all seen what happens if a witness really doesn't want to comply with a congressional subpoena. Ah, forget it, I'm not showing up. Mm -hmm. And it's up to Congress to try and go through its well, let's say, uh, questionable abilities to enforce those subpoenas. Meanwhile, the DOJ, when it wants a subpoena enforced, it enforces the subpoena. They also can go to a judge and get a search warrant, which is even more powerful, where they do the searching themselves. And in a grand jury proceeding, everything's secret. We don't even know right. what they're looking at unless and until they indict. All right, so let's take their surprise at their word that she flew under the radar. What part of this are they... It, it does seem as if they've got a lot of effort on, on the people who went after the Capitol. They got a lot of effort on some of the far-right violent groups. They're doing something on the elector front. We saw all that action. It does not look like they've penetrated the West Wing. That's essentially what they're admitting here, if they're shocked by Cassidy, that they have not yet touched the president. You think that's a Garland decision? It is a Garland decision. I mean, it could be said that all of these committee hearings are for the American public, but they're also for an audience of one, mm -hmm. and that's Merrick Garland. But the DOJ is going to be circumspect about what they have and what they don't have. Do I think they were truly shocked by what Cassidy Hutchinson said? Only if... She stated something under oath the other day that was, for the first time, never before disclosed. That's really, in my mind, the only way the DOJ could have been surprised. Because, Chuck, this is an institution, the DOJ, that was built to investigate. It was built to persuade witnesses to come in and talk to them mm -hmm. or to testify. I mean, when you see a witness testify under oath, that's kind of the end of the long path. Uh, the DOJ has so many tools to get somebody to come in and bear their soul, yeah. uh, not the least of which reminding them that they may be in huge trouble for even lying to a federal agent. Realistically, we know how long DOJ has been working on this. When do you think they would feel that they have enough to start pursuing indictments? Are we six months away, a year away? What's your estimate? That's always the big question. When and do they have enough? And again, the DOJ was designed to investigate and for what, since their inception, yeah. they do not let you know. They don't give a status report on where they are with investigations. They remain silent. 
And sometimes you or anyone else may be investigated. We're counting people like lawyers, people like you to tell us, hey, this happened, this happened. That's exactly. No yeah, out. I mean, yeah. And, and people who may be targets may never have known they were targets if the DOJ declines to indict. I mean, that's how secretive they are and how, how many more tools they have to not only persuade people to come in and talk to them, right. but obtain documents, search warrants, things like that. So this whole part about the Cassidy Hutchinson shocking the DOJ, yeah. that might be a little bit of spin on their part. It has to be because if she was anywhere on the radar, the DOJ would have been all over it, and they would have been over it silently. And if, if she's not on their radar, it makes you wonder how thorough they're being. Danny Savalos, I uh, really appreciate it. Thank you, sir. When we come back... Tuesday's hearing portrayed Donald Trump as a bit out of control and bent on sedition. How much does it matter to a Republican Party that has been enthralled to him? Panel is next. Welcome back, panelists here. NBC News Capitol Hill correspondent Ali Vitale, former Homeland Security Secretary Jay Johnson, Matthew Continetti of the American Enterprise Institute, and Mariana Sotomayor of the Washington Post. So with Donald Trump, we've been here a million times. It started with attacking John McCain, and we go down the line, and you have access Hollywood tape, and you think, boy, this is the one. No, this is the one. No, this is the one. Matthew, let me start with you. Is this the one? Is this week the one? No. There have been so Bold. much, there's been so much <laughs> smoke from these smoking guns over six years that it clouds your eyes. And um, I think there are some questions about the testimony of Ms. Hutchinson. I think it's still a long way from her testimony to getting Merrick Garland to file charges against a former president of the United States. So while I think this is a reminder to the country of Donald Trump's irresponsible and impeachable actions after the election of 2020, I don't think it's a smoking but there's, gun. Isn't there so much space between where the, those two things, like getting the DOJ to file and anything changing for Trump, there's so much space between those things. And I think that when you see people like the Washington Examiner coming out and saying that he shouldn't be president again, I mean, there are metrics that are changing. And it was always true during the Trump years that Republicans were always more comfortable saying privately in our text messages than they were on television that this was a very, very bad thing. But I think that you're sort of getting to a point where you almost can't avoid saying that when the thing in dispute here is like grabbing at a steering wheel, but the thing that's not in dispute is the fact that he wanted to go to the Capitol and lead the rioters. Mariana, have you heard from Republicans quietly like, oh, all right, I'm out or not yet? Oh, no. I mean, I was texting a couple of aides who work for lawmakers who are still very close to Trump, and everyone is pushing it aside. They were, before even Trump said on his social media platform, you know, Cassidy Hutchinson, none of this is true. Yeah. She is an outsider to us. These aides were already saying that. They all say that this is not going to play a role in the midterms. No one's paying attention to this. If you ask them about 24, though, and what this means for Trump potentially right. running, that's when they start to get a little squeamish. It, but for it's, the... it's easier for them to say that. Correct. Jay? I have to begin with this. Um, while a lot of men are hiding under their desk in lawyers' offices, this hearing has really been a profile in courage among women. Uh, Caroline Edwards, Cass Hutchinson, and Liz Cheney. I think that this hearing has been choreographed exceptionally well for the attention span of the average American in 2022. I see a case being developed of the criminal charges that Danny laid out, plus uh, giving aid and comfort to an insurrection. What happened on January 6th was the very definition of an insurrection. I'm concerned as the, the former federal prosecutor in me, that gets you a lot of cred these days on, yeah. on, on television. They, I'm concerned that the committee may have overreached on the incident in the vehicle. It hmm. was colorful. It was vivid. It was collateral to the central charge. If And it was secondhand hearsay. Well, let me pause you there because it's funny you say that because the fact that the former president is obsessing over the incident yeah. and nothing else of the testimony I think speaks volumes. Take a listen to how he's characterizing this. This lady yesterday, there's something wrong with her? Is there something wrong? She said, I jumped from a car and I started strangling. Think of this. I started strangling a Secret Service agent right. who I know very well. I grabbed the steering wheel of a car uh, that said that I wanted guns at my rally. I didn't want guns. I have to speak to and I don't did, want did guns for anybody. Did you grab the steering wheel? Is, that, is there any truth uh, to that? Of course not. Is that What's fascinating is that they try to find me. What Trump's always been good at is finding a specific he thinks he can yeah. 
deny to try to cast doubt on everything. Here's why I would have hesitated on that. If Ali Vitali tells me that Mariana told her, that Matt told Mariana, <laughs> yeah. that Chuck Todd hit him, yeah. I would want to know exactly what Matt has to say about that incident firsthand. I'd before be willing I go to testify. With the, with the All right, it's good to know. <laughs> under right. oath? Uh, under oath, yeah. a federal law enforcement officer under oath. So the committee perhaps knows something that the rest of us don't know, but before I went out with the secondhand hearsay, which is going to get a lot of attention, I'd want to know what the firsthand witness has to say. Or I think by the time she told us the story, it was technically we're in our third version. Of, yeah. It's a third-hand account. It depends yeah. on how you interpret right. hearsay. But, you know, that testimony would not have been admissible in a courtroom. Um, and as you know, Secret Service agents don't normally talk about what they see, what they hear mm -hmm. from their protectees. I was a protectee of the Secret Service for three years, and you, they have to be in a position to hear and see all kinds of very sensitive things. But look, lawmakers were briefed late on what the Cassidy Hutchinson testimony was going to be. Like, the rank and file of the mm -hmm. committee were briefed late on this. There was some discussion among them, I'm told, on whether or not this key detail should have been included, oh, and that now they're at a point where... This is out there, right? And we know that people like the vice chair of the committee, Liz Cheney, have really wanted to push the envelope of what the committee includes. This is obviously one of those headline-grabbing details, but I do think that it's fair to wonder whether or not her testimony would have been as shocking as it was, and I would argue that it would have been, even if you didn't have just those few details of what happened in the limo. Because again, and I think this is where the committee continues to come down on it, is they don't want you to miss the forest from the trees on this. You know, they could have shared the same incident and not that detail that he was irate right. that he kept that he urging and they and they and the secret service had to tell right. him no 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 yeah. it's the same I mean, allegation the bottom line is this hearing in particular but all of the j6 committee hearings have riveted the beltway and the question <laughs> is is it getting beyond the beltway and when you look at republican party voters they are slowly less enthusiastic about Donald Trump in 2024. Well, isn't but that I think a sign that's that more it's working? I think that's more a function of time yeah. and looking for something new than it is all of these salacious details coming from the committee. But, Mariana, I think you, brought, you hit on something. It is easier to criticize Trump as it's a bad idea for you to run again than it is to have to directly deal with this. Right. Exactly. Yes. And, you know, a lot of aides right now are kind of wondering when, if Trump decides to run, when does he want to announce? And they don't want him to talk Whenever the about, indictment comes down, right? Well, they don't want him to talk about this at any point in time <laughs> right. ahead of the midterms because he is such a liability. He's such an unknown. Republicans are on the path to take back the majority in the House. It's possible they do it in the Senate. They don't want a random announcement by Trump because he can be a liability to a lot of swing voters. The irony is that if the, if the Republicans fail... Wherever they fail, it's all Donald Trump's fault, either directly or indirectly. Either how, Matthew, he got involved in primaries for bad candidates. You could argue Roe v. Wade in an indirect way. And obviously January 6th, like, but for, the but for paragraph on the day after the election, if Republicans have a disappointing night, is all going to be Trump, right? Think about the Georgia special elections right. for the Senate on January 5th, <laughs> but 2021, right? Donald Trump is not a political winner for the Republican Party, and yet Many Republicans yeah. don't seem able to accept that. Jay, fact. Uh, I'm very curious, this little dispute between the committee and justice. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> if justice was surprised by Cassidy Hutchinson, to me that sounds like justice isn't really pursuing the West Wing yet. Well, the dispute between Congress and the Department of Justice is not new. Any mm -hmm. incident that is investigated by both branches, there's always a fight about who gets to go first, uh, whether or not the committee has to turn over all the, the mm -hmm. testimony and, and, and so forth. If, in fact, the Department of Justice didn't know what Cass Hutchinson was going to say, that suggests that they, they're, they're not focused on this. they got a long way to go, don't or they? Or they have a long way to go. Also makes sense why they want the committee's transcripts, right? <laughs> but Sure, but as Zoe Loughran said, they have a lot more powerful subpoenas. Of they're course. focused now. I'm certain they are focused now. That's probably a fair point. All right, we're going to pause there. Up next is the Biden administration. Administration fighting hard enough to secure abortion rights, not according to many Democrats. I'm going to talk to HHS Secretary Javier Becerra when we come back. Welcome back. The Supreme Court ruling overturning Roe v. Wade has left Democrats both angry and exasperated. Angry because it took away a right they had supported and counted on for half a century. And exasperated because many Democrats feel the Biden administration was not prepared for something that they had a, a little bit of a lead time on, and 
They still believe they're not doing enough to ensure abortion rights. Well, HHS Secretary Javier Becerra argues there's not a lot the administration can do. There is no magic bullet, but if there is something we can do, we will find it and we will do it at HHS. And Secretary Becerra joins me now. And let me pick up on what you said there. You've been spending some days finding and uh, uh, trying to find new avenues. Is there any avenue you found that can actually expand abortion rights uh, in places that it's going to be taken away? Chuck, not, uh, if you look at our laws and the way we administer them, when the Supreme Court speaks, unless we're all going to say that the word of the Supreme Court will no longer have value, we have to heed the word of the Supreme Court. And so we will, but we will continue to find every avenue possible to make sure women have access to the care that they need, including abortion care. Let's talk about one of the proposals that was out there that got shot down pretty quickly. It was something that a couple of Democrats called for, including Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez, which is maybe temporary clinics on federal land. Um, uh, as in, and, you know, fight it in the court, you know, let the courts say no uh, and, and instead try it. Did you guys look into this at all? I, I think we're continuing to explore everything that's out there. Uh, the, the difficulty is that simply because it's an idea doesn't mean it can go out into practice. And so what we want to make sure is we can put things out into practice because you have people who are right now in need of abortion care services. So we're going to do what we can to give people something as quickly as we can. Even if it may not be everything they like, we want to make sure we're providing everything we can. The, uh, one of the things that maybe the federal government can can strengthen is access to medication to the medications for abortion. Um, what actions do you think you can take that would essentially speed up the process uh, at the FDA? Well, we want to make sure that medication abortion, which is currently available uh, in America, continues to be uh, such that it can, can be accessed by those who need it most. We will continue to protect those federally required aspects of medication abortion, and we'll do everything we can where it's possible, for example, in terms of emergency care, to make sure that women have access to the services that they need. You said something to my colleague Kate Snow that about transporting women to other states was something that maybe HHS would take the lead on uh, and help with officially. Have you looked into that and can you legally do it? We are exploring the opportunity to work with others to make sure that if a woman is trying to access that care that she needs, that we'll be supportive of that. Uh, there are a lot of partners, public and private, who are looking into this. We're one of those partners. What are you looking in to see? Is it a, a legal question? Does it have to do with the Hyde Amendment? What is it that you're concerned about legally? All of the above. We have to make sure, Chuck, that we stay within the confines of the law and that we have the resources to do it and that our authorities allow us to do it. You know, it's interesting you say confines of the law. You know, one of the hallmarks of the last administration was he'd obviously push the envelope and essentially let the courts stop him. There are many Democrats now who say, you know what? Make the courts stop you. Try this. Get caught trying, whether it's on federal lands, whether it's on transportation. It sounds like you've got a directive from the president that says don't push the envelope. Is that fair? Oh, I think it's just the opposite. Uh, the president in his annou first announcement said that he was uh, tasking us at HHS to take on a number of issues, including medication abortion. And so he has asked us to to seek as, as aggressive a strategy as we can. Uh, but we, we do, unlike the previous administration, we do intend to respect the law. What do you tell your former congressional Democratic colleagues who are just feel as if the administration, you know, I, I looked at the list of things that you guys are doing and there's not much you can do. I, I looked and, and it, it's pretty clear because you don't want to get outside the law. What do you tell these congressional Democrats that feel like the party's not fighting hard enough? Well, I, I tell them, give us some good ideas. We're going to explore everything we can. And I also would ask them to please pass a law. Uh, they have it in their power if they can find the votes to actually codify Roe, the Roe decision, which is what we need more than anything else. Executive action, we will find what we can and do as much as we can. But when you are stripped of a right 
as the Supreme Court has just done to every woman of childbearing age, uh, it is tough to overcome. It took 50 years for us to get as far as we did. Now we have to figure out how to do this. It will not be easy. So the bottom line, it sounds like the administration is essentially saying, look, if you want to fix it now, Congress is your only route. There's not much the executive branch can do. Fair? Well, Chuck, I, I wouldn't go that far because we will, we will find ways to make sure women exercise their rights and that women are protected. Uh, it's just not going to be easy. The fastest route is to reinstitute that right that women had until five justices on the Supreme Court decided to use their authority in ways that deny millions of Americans the right to good health and perhaps even their life. Have you thought about the fact that at times when you were in Congress, there were some big Democratic majorities? Um, it, was this just something that folks thought was never really at risk, and that's why it never got brought up for codification? Oh, I've been around long enough to know that nothing's ever totally safe. Uh, but remember, we, we still haven't even been able to pass the Equal Rights Amendment. And so this country has a way to go. But certainly, I, I don't believe this decision by this court in Dobbs is going to stand long. It's just not America. Uh, we don't, we're not about taking rights. Most people haven't, around the world haven't looked at the U.S. Uh, as the beacon of light because we, because we do things like Dobbs. Uh, just the opposite. So I'm confident that we're going to get past this. It's just that for now, we ha uh, the five justices on the Supreme Court have made life very difficult and in some cases impossible and for it, some women. Uh, so that means this has to be done legislatively. There is no other way to fix this because the court is the court for quite some time. Well, the court is the court. The court couldn't do the injustice it just visited on millions of women. Uh, but I don't expect five justices in this court to do that. And so the next best route is to pass a law to codify Roe. Javier Becerra, Secretary of the Health and Human Services. Appreciate you coming on, sharing your perspective with us, sir. Thank you. Happy Fourth. Thanks, Todd. Sure. Thanks, Chip. When we come back, Clarence Thomas suggested the Supreme Court might want to reconsider other rights, like same-sex marriage. Why that might not be so easy politically. Stay with us. Welcome back, Data Download Time. Last week's Supreme Court decision to overturn Roe had many wondering what could be next. In fact, Justice Clarence Thomas wondered himself. He wrote in a concurring decision about his desire to reconsider some other social contract precedents, including 2015's Obergefell v. Hodges, which legalized same-sex marriage. But reversing that decision won't be easy, as it would land among a public that has already rapidly evolved on that issue. As you can see, at the start of this century, Support for same-sex marriage was actually below 50%. Just 42% of the country supported it. 55% were against. You saw all those ballot initiatives. That was the George Bush re-election. And then what you saw, you saw slow uh, agreement of it. President Obama endorses it. The numbers get close to 50. Obergefell happens. It was already at 55. And then after it's legal, it shoots up to 71. And in fact, the legalization of same-sex marriage appears to have made more people uh, comfortable identifying uh, honestly about what they are. In fact, in 2012, just 3.5% of the country identified as LGBTQ. That number is more than doubled in less than 10 years. And it's being driven mostly by a younger generation who has grown up in a world where same-sex marriage is legal. So, for instance, among Gen Z, 20% of Gen Z identify as something other than heterosexual. And as you can see, you go down by age groups and you can see those that have lived more in a world with legal uh, Same-sex marriage is more likely to be comfortable identifying as something other than heterosexual. And you can just see the changes there. And just to give you a breakdown of the entire LGBTQ population these days, 30% are in under the age of 25, according to polling. And as you can see, the numbers get a little bit lower. But under 35, you see nearly a, a quarter is under 35, and then the numbers get lower. But that is what's happened here as same, the longer same-sex marriage has been legal, the more comfortable many Americans are identifying publicly. When we come back, some Democrats are saying President Biden might want to think about not running in 2024. You know who's not listening? Joe Biden. Back in a moment. Welcome back. Democrats appear to be getting a bump, at least for now, after the Supreme Court's abortion decision. But you know who is not benefiting? President Biden. 
Take a look at this NPR Marist poll that we've put together here. In April, Republicans had a three-point lead in the generic congressional ballot. President's approval rating sat at 41%. Flash forward to June. Same pollster. Now it's Democrats up seven points. Mr. Biden's approval rating it actually went down a point. It's obviously uh, margin of error stuff at 40%. Jay Johnson, uh, it's pretty clear that one of the predictions that was out there was that this abortion decision could energize Democrats in a way that Joe Biden hadn't. And not only is it energizing Democrats, it's still not helping Joe Biden. You're asking me the political question. <laughs> um, so um, I, I think that voters are just, and this is a, probably a hangover from the Trump years, just in a cranky mood about whoever is the leader these days. Uh, we're just not happy with all the things happening around us, and we tend to want to blame the person in, in charge right now. Mm -hmm. um, on abortion, I think that rather than uh, crafting legislation to somehow codify Roe, Roe, Roe was a constitutional right for 50 years. Mm. You can't create by statute a constitutional right. Congress should devote its energy to, um, it has plainly the power to regulate interstate commerce. That's mm. in, the, in the Constitution. So that we make it a, plainly available for any woman in state A who wants to go to state B to get an abortion, that she should be able to do mm. so. She, free to do so. Congress can regulate and legislate that. You should keep not, you're nodding your head to that. Matthew. Oh, I think that's a, that'd be an effective pro-choice strategy and, mm. and, and achievable, by the way, right. because you can, also, you can point to it in the Constitution, which is much harder to do with the abortion right. But I, I just want to say one thing. It's not just that voters are cranky. It's, things are bad. We have record inflation. We have a record poor performance in the stock market. Right. We have um, consumer sentiment plunging. Um, the economy is still the number one issue in voters' minds. And they tie this economy to Joe Biden and his economic policies. It's different in some of these Senate and gubernatorial races right. where voters can make an individual decision based on candidate a attributes. All right, I want to uh, lean on the abortion issue a, a little bit. Ali, I, there's been congressional Democrats very frustrated. I can yeah. put up some. Here's Cori Bush. We just can't tell people, well, just vote. Vote your problems away because yes. they're looking at us and saying, well, we already voted for you referring to an all-democratic control. Charlie Crist, who's running for governor in Florida, frustration requires action, and there's no vent for it. Uh, and then Elizabeth Warren, Democrats have the tools to fight back. We just need to use them. What are all they, how are they going to react to Javier Becerra and the sort of, well, there's not much we can do? I think that that's what I hear the most from my sources on the Hill, as well as in advocacy groups, is, yes, Congress and the White House are pretty hamstrung in terms of what they can do to tangibly protect women's right to access this health care. But at the same time, they just want them to do something, do something at the state level, whether it's on federal lands. And governors asked Biden about this again today as they met with him, the idea that they want them to, to push the envelope on this to the point where, OK, if it does end up in a court somewhere, at least Democrats are trying. And I would also make the point that as much as Republicans want to continue pointing to this as a moment in economics, abortion is an economics issue for women across the country. And I think that women are frustrated, they are enraged, and they'll vote on this, and the polling is bearing that out. Ariana, there was another sort of tone that I thought Secretary Becerra took, which is like, look, we're, and it's clear this is coming, I think, from President Biden. We're not going to push the envelope. We're not going to do what those guys did. And I know this is a Joe Biden stubbornness. Gosh darn it, we're going to restore these institutions. And I know a lot of Democrats are going, stop doing it. Get yeah. caught trying. Let the courts say no. A hundred percent. That's exactly what you're hearing, especially from progressives who, since last Friday, were outside of the Supreme Court, basically saying just that, promising women who were there. How many times did Trump try to build his wall? I mean, exactly. a zillion. And how many and, different ways and did he... And House Republicans right. and Senate also tried to do that. They right. obviously had their issues. They couldn't get a lot of immigration stuff done. And, you know, the House Democrats are going to try to respond to this. And they, of course, can pass any bill under the sun because they have the majority. Mm -hmm. But they're looking at things like, you know, can a woman not be charged, penalized for going getting an abortion yeah. in another state? That's something that they likely will vote on this upcoming month. Something also is reproductive rights on, on, on reproductive data on oh, apps. Awesome. Right, exactly. Right. They're going to try and also put Republicans on the record to co codify a number of different things. Gay rights, 
birth control. Right. But again, it's going to die in the Senate. But there's and nothing's going to happen. Strategy there. too, right? There's concern that I've heard from some who say, yes, we want to just do a vote on rape and mm. incest exceptions. There's a concern that if they did that, especially in the Senate, as they try to make this a wedge issue in the midterms, which clearly the polling is working, that it's going to make some Republicans and give them the opportunity to look a little bit this, rational on this and not as mm. extreme as Democrats want them to be. But <laughs> Democrats can also seem extreme on abortion. It's important to realize. And if you, when you get to brass tacks and you say you want to have unrestricted abortion throughout the pregnancy, many Americans blanch. M Americans want to have abortion access in the early pr stages right. of pregnancy, but then they want to increasingly regulate as you get closer right. to term. This, That's something Democrats need to be aware of as well. Don't go to term this, this and is the have problem. I'm talking about the politics pregnancy. and the public opinion. This is the problem with Washington. It's got to be about more than just energizing the base. Um, <laughs> focus on the things that are doable to protect the woman's ability uh, to have an abortion in states where it is legal and safe right now. And there are things Congress can do to protect that right, to go from state A to state B through its interstate commerce power. It's got to be more than just energizing the base for the midterms. All right. Let me switch a little bit to uh, this issue of Joe Biden. Um, Jay, I'll let you take the first crack at it. Joe Biden is really upset. He feels he's being disrespected. He feels as if the party has never, there is a little bit of Rodney Dangerfield in him. You know, they've never really given me respect. And all I do is, you know, they didn't want me to run in 15 and look what happened to, in 16. Then they, they didn't want me to run in 20 and look what happened. I actually won. Now they don't want me to run in 24. Does he have a point? Um, uh, in, in, in a sense, yes. Um, I'll, and I, I don't know that, and this is just instinct, I don't know that Joe Biden has definitively made up his mind to run in 2024. I'm sure at some point he's going to have that conversation with his family. My advice would be uh, unconventional. Um, make that announcement. If you're not running, make that announcement sooner rather than later, even before the midterms. It opens the floodgates, that's it, for sure. But it gives others an opportunity to prepare. And, and to get organized for 2024. Do the opposite of what Donald Trump's going to do, which is to keep us all in suspense to the last minute. Ali, where is most of this hand-wringing about Biden coming from? I don't sense it comes from Congress. I sense it comes from governors and maybe those that want to run for president. But of course it would, right? I mean, I also do think that there is some consternation around the idea that Biden came in saying he would restore institutional norms. And maybe it's because we're going through the January 6th hearings and maybe it's because the economy looks the way that it does. But there's this feeling like you promised me it would be normal and this doesn't feel like a normal that I want to accept. So certainly we're post normal in whatever sense that that means. I do also think, though, that and I'm not saying this because I have a book coming out about this, but it feels <laughs> like there is an, an agitating moment for for female leadership right now. Mm. And that could be where part of this is coming from, where people look to the fact that Kamala Harris is the vice president. Mm. There are female leaders in the party. That could be part of it, too. All right, guys, it's time for hot dogs, fireworks, and all sorts of things. And let's get to 247 as a country after we celebrate 246. That's all we have for today. Thank you for watching. Please enjoy your Independence Day weekend. And remember what it's really all about and what America's about. We'll be back next week, because if it's Sunday, let's meet the press. Thanks for watching our YouTube channel. Follow today's top stories and breaking news by downloading the NBC News app.